Wow, Stan, nine years later, here we are. Amazing. I think it's really important that everybody actually get a vision of what Stan did and said nine years ago. So, shall we start with a clip from the Aspen Ideas Festival nine years ago? Very interested to hear you say that because I was at, a, uh, at, at one of these session, uh, sessions this morning when Charles Murray was talking about the disconnect that is now developed between the very upper classes and, and the middle class. There seems to be no real common experience for Americans anymore that we can all share. I mean, I'm old enough to remember uh, World War II and when everybody had an uncle or a father or, or somebody, that everybody had a stake in it. And, and I, I, it, it saddens me now to know that I actually know people, good people, who don't know a single person in the United States military. My guess is we're not gonna get a draft through. But what is your take on some sort of mandatory uh, national service? I am becoming a little bit more extreme on this each year. Uh, right now, I think everybody 56 years old and younger ought to have to serve two years. I'm 57. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, no, what, what I really believe is I think we need national service, and I think you need it either at the conclusion of high school or university. I don't, I don't think people, I don't think young people would really fight it if, if it was fair, if everybody did it. You can only take a small part of that in the military, so I'm not talking military, I'm talking about all kinds of things. But I also think that the payoff is not what they do. It's not whether they go pill, build roads and parks or, or that sort of thing. It's what you put inside them. Because once you have contributed to something, you have a slightly different view of it. And I think that it would be good to have a shared experience. If, if every person that's age 25 and older gets, meets in a play area and they all, the first question is, hey, where'd you serve? What'd you do? If that's the start of the conversation, I think it'd be really powerful. I think Israel gets amazing value out of that. Scaling big ideas is what the Aspen Ideas Festival is all about. And Stan, that was a home run. Congratulations. What a hero you are. Bravo. What made you say that nine years ago? And, and why do you think that that idea led to action so quickly? Well, the, the, the rest of the story here, because you gotta hear it. Uh, we finished that conversation, I left the stage, and my wife and I got on bikes and went to the home of a friend of ours. And then a person who'd been in the audience came up there and said, wow, congratulations. I said, for what? And they said, the idea, you got a standing ovation, which I'd already left the stage, and people really grabbed onto that idea. And I said, well, that's good. And then the next day, Walter got a hold of me, and then you cornered me, Elliot cornered me, put me in a headlock, and nine years later, here I am. Couldn't be more proud to be the smallest part of something. And interestingly, a few years ago when we were doing an event for this, my wife, Annie, who's here, pulled me aside after the event. She says, you know, I think if this thing becomes reality, the part you're playing is gonna be the best thing you ever did in your life. And I think she's right. Because the reality is, I had never thought about civilian service while I was in uniform, but when I got out, it became obvious to me that that shared experience and the sense of ownership of part of our society, responsibility to others, is something that every young person has a right to experience. Not just a responsibility, but a right to that time when they are put in a time when we need you, and they stand up. Bravo. You know, many of you, woo, many of you may not realize, but we do have a national service small program in this country. It's called AmeriCorps. It was started in 1992 by Bill Clinton. And people are paid about $25,000 a year. And to this day, that's the same thing that they're paid. Pretty crazy. However, even with 80,000 spots in AmeriCorps, there are hundreds and hundreds of thousands of applicants. There is more demand than we have supply for. We have got to fill that need. So what is it? Why is national service the solution to healing our country post-pandemic? What can we do through national service that will help to heal us? 
Well, there's a tradition in our country of service, and that service goes widely. And sometimes it was just to your community. It was to your local fire, volunteer fire department or barn raising or whatever. But in the last probably 40 or 50 years, we've allowed the concept of citizenship to erode. If you pay your taxes, if you vote, you know, you've checked the block. But the reality, citizenship is a lot more than that. Citizenship's responsibility more broadly. And because it's eroded and because we haven't had any call to action that has really World War II-like size, we lack that common connection. Think of young people in America from different zip codes, economic backgrounds, religions, whatever political backgrounds. They not only don't agree with each other, they don't know each other. They have no interaction whatsoever. One of the things you do see in the Army is when people are forced together, suddenly they have a different view of the people they deal with. And they walk away with, yeah, they were different, but you know, they're okay. If we could create that common experience, something that everybody does, it starts by connecting people. Mm -hmm. And then the second is it connects the idea of ownership. Ownership for what happens in our nation in a broad sense. Mm -hmm. Today, we have about a billion dollars spent on national service. But that only funds the 80,000 spots. Yeah. Congress has just appropriated, and President Biden just signed, yeah. $1.4 billion more through the COVID Relief Act so that we can use national service as a way to support this country after the pandemic. So now the question is, how can private philanthropy, yeah. people like Lori Tish, who's been very involved, and myself and many others, how can we provide philanthrop philanthropic support for this kind of an effort in addition to corporations? So for example, Cisco Systems. Can you talk a little bit about what Cisco did to step up to support this program? I, I can. I'll talk that first and go more broadly. Cisco stepped in first with funding but also with uh, technical help. They helped us create a platform where you could match opportunities for national service with young people and their parents who could get online and see what might fit for them. Mm -hmm. And it was a practical way, almost like an employment agency, that you could suddenly connect people with things that they could do. But more broadly, the issue of philanthropy, if we go back to national service, it's our belief that if you want to change America, you've got to get to a certain critical mass on the number of young people each year who can do it. We think that's a million. There are four million young people in each year group. We think when you get to 25%, then suddenly every lunch table, every family dinner table, every group of people will have somebody who's doing it or has done it. Suddenly the idea starts to be more viral. viral. The problem is that's expensive. It's gonna take 22 or $23 billion a year to fund a program like that at an effective level. You can't do that just with government funding, although the government's got a requirement. The government has to have skin in the game. And the billion dollars we got this year because of the American Rescue Act, and hopefully that will come larger with the CORE Act, CORE Act, needs to be met with private philanthropy. It needs to be met, one, because pirate philanthropy can help push things forward. It kept this movement alive eight or nine years ago when we were really kind of stuck in first gear trying to get it, and the generosity of you and a number of other people kept it going in its darkest hours. But now we're at this moment of opportunity. Our nation is more divided than ever. I would argue we are in a crisis period of American society, probably similar to 1860, for those of you who are familiar with the years before the American Civil War. And if we don't address it at its most basic, then we are going to have big problems. So now is the moment when we have to act. Now is the moment that we have some momentum that we need to match pressure on our own government and our own generosity and, of course, the energy where people can do it to try to make this move faster. Stan, this is a perfect example of private-public partnerships where private individuals and philanthropies, philanthropists, foundations, corporations match with, corporation, math, match with the government to really launch this into, into a, a scaled up effort. Another example of this is that in small communities, the Lilly Endowment, which is another uh, foundation out of uh, Indianapolis, has created a wonderful opportunity for communities across the country. And please apply if your community is interested. You can contact Stan's organization, Service Year Alliance. 
The idea here is that in small communities, they can have a chief service officer who reports to the mayor. They can have corporations in the local community fund, pro fund some of the opportunities along with the government. And that way, people can serve from across the community in terms of supporting COVID relief and other, other ways. So my question to you is, now that we have this idea of public-private partnerships, how do we scale that to the size of, of millions strong, as you've called for? Yeah, there, there are several components to it. One, of course, political. We need political leadership to stand up very publicly and push it. We need the most senior political leaders. Many of you in this room are influencers. Some good friends are influencers in this room, can change people's minds. We need to talk about it. We need to push it. We need to create the idea in young people it's possible. The second thing we need to do, of course, is make it practical. In all of the areas, local businesses and things like that can help this. We have things called Friends of National Service, and businesses can do simple things like say, if you come to my business and we hire you, and you go away for a year to do national service, we'll hold your job, or if we hire you before you ever report. If really powerful businesses hired people and then said, great, report for duty right as soon as you finish a year of national service, then suddenly you'd have an incentive. We've also got to create some incentive programs for young people who do serve. Mm -hmm. It's got to be viewed as something you lead, not just a contribution, but also something that makes you better. Part of its experience, part of its connections, but there, also be an ed there should be an educational benefit to it, similar to the GI Bill. Because I think civilian service is the other side of the same coin of military service. It should be viewed exactly the same way, and we should use the term veteran to apply to people who serve the country in whatever fits best for them. And if we put all of those things together, a combination of incentives for young people, the idea, and then there should be a little bit of coercion. And the coercion I talk about is if somebody wants to run for Congress, and they are an ambitious young person, they get up behind the podium, somebody asks them, where did you serve? How did you serve? And if they look down at their shoes, they ought to want to escape from the stage right away. That kind of pressure are things we can do for our society that I think would be really valuable. You know, we, we talk about the expectation of service, and, and our two children both served. They both did uh, some time working in, uh, in, in Congress, supporting U.S. senators, and they understood, as a result, the bureaucracy and sometimes the inaction of our government, and yet they understood that that's the way to scale and that's the way actually to get things done. I think it's so important to have a gap year, either before college or afterwards. So can you talk about the idea of the culture of service through taking gap years at some point during your, your progress as a young adult? Yeah, I would tell you one of the things that impedes service right now are us in this room, our generation. And part of it is because our sons and daughters get to the age of college, they get accepted somewhere, they get an opportunity, and they would like to go out and do a gap year, and we go, yeah, but you got accepted to the University of X. That may not happen next year, you need to go. So we don't talk about it, we don't push them hard enough. So I think one thing is to have that conversation at home. Second, in places like schools, create that idea that says, if I, I teach at Yale, if someone applies to Yale, there ought to be two piles for applications, one for people who've done national service and one for people who haven't. And the people who've done national service ought to get a little bit of another look. They ought to say, and that's good. <laughs> I select people for my class every year. We hand select them, and I will tell you, there are very few in there that haven't done some some kind of service, just trying to send a message. So I think we can do those kinds of things which will make it a little bit, bit, little bit easier for the serve. You know, if you think about a gap year, almost all of us would be better if we'd taken a year off. <laughs> if I'd taken a year before I went to West Point, I would have been a better cadet. I could not have been a worse cadet, but <laughs> the, the bottom line is I would have been better, even in the middle of if I'd gone two years to school and then gone off and done something, I'd have come back better. We just don't have it in our habit right now mm -hmm. to do that, and we need to create that opportunity. So you talked about the serviceyear.org website. I would urge all of you to take a look at serviceyear.org because, as Stan mentioned, you can go on there and actually list your criteria. I want to serve in 
healthcare or in education, and I want to start in New Orleans, and I want to start in September, and a list of opportunities will actually come up. It's really quite an extraordinary way for us to now make it so accessible to do national service. And with that, you've got a whole new opening to young people. Don't you think colleges and universities should promote that too? Well, and, and I've spoken to every college president I can think of. And I'll be honest, I get head nods. I get, yeah, that's a great idea. And I go, will you do it? And they go, and some have, but it's been a minority. We have to put pressure, we who donate to colleges, we who teach at colleges, you know, we need to put pressure on leaders to make hard decisions, just like I talked about business leaders. You know, if Goldman Sachs, and I talked to David Solomon about this, I said, if you wouldn't hire anybody that didn't do service, it would be and send a powerful message. But we've all got to take a little chance in doing this. And, you know, go back to why it's important. We are not going to fix the problems in our country. No one in this room above the age of 50 is going to fix our problems. We are going to hopefully enable it for younger people to fix it. If we don't give them the chance to do that, if we don't get upstream of it, if we don't create in them the opportunity and the values, it's not going to happen. And if it doesn't happen, then I think we all need to be concerned. Absolutely. I'm going to ask one or two more questions, and then we'd love to ask, ask you all to raise your hand, and I'll be happy to call on you so that you can ask General McChrystal a question or two. You mentioned the idea of bipartisanship and that Congress has to act. Yeah. So right now we have this, this piece of legislation that you mentioned, the CORE Act, C-O-R-P-S. It stands for Cultivating Opportunity and Response to the Pandemic Through Service. This has nine Democrats and nine Republicans in the Senate co-sponsoring. It's unbelievable. Chris Coons, Roger Wicker, Marco Rubio, Cory Booker, Roy Blunt, Lindsey Graham, John Cornyn, Bill Cassidy, and late John McCain was a supporter before he passed. We've never seen that kind of bipartisanship. It would increase the number of opportunities. It would double them to 150,000 to provide 600,000 over the next three years. And it would be focused on unemployed youth and others looking to assist their local communities. Senator Wicker said, helping our nation respond to and recover from the coronavirus outbreak will require an all hands approach Boosting the ranks of our service corps is a cost-efficient way to get communities the help that they need. This is a, such an important piece of legislation. What are we doing at Service Year Alliance, and what have you been doing as you've talked to your colleagues in the Senate to try to make sure that this thing passes? Well, pushed it hard. Of course, to me, it, it, because it's bipartisan, it should give political leaders a, a place to say, look, I'm bipartisan, look what I just did. And that's sort of craven politics, but I don't care if, if that works. The other thing we need to do is try to get the most senior leaders to make it part of their agendas. Get Senator McConnell, get Senator Schumer, get President Biden to stand up and say that this is a priority for them. And then you give overhead cover for other people to come in and move that. But again, at the end of the day, we've got to provide the pressure for that. Absolutely. I have one lot more question, and I'm going to take your questions. It seems that we have, between now and the 20th anniversary of 9-11, to really call this country together to push for this new big idea, passing the CORE Act and really scaling up this idea of national service. So the Service Year Alliance, under General McChrystal's leadership, is creating a, a new campaign. It's being called the United Through Service National Campaign. Between now and the 20th anniversary of 9-11, the idea is to rally for the passage of the CORE Act. So, can you reflect on your 34 years in the military, the, 24, the 20th anniversary of 9-11, and how we as a country need to see military service and civilian service as really important and co-equal elements to ways to, for ways to, for young people to serve their country? Yeah, I, I'm going to be pretty direct here. You know, we get opportunities to stand up as a nation and to unify and operate well when circumstances force them. If we go back to the Second World War, the Depression, we had generations stand up and do that. 9-11 came, and for a very brief period, I think the United States thought this will be a, a forcing function for us to come together with less politics, with more idea of serving, 
and we missed it, in my view. We missed an opportunity to unify a nation for lots of reasons. I think COVID-19 did the same thing. We had another external threat that everybody could be against and we could help each other. And I don't think we did very well at unifying the nation through it. I think we missed the opportunity. The problem now is it doesn't seem like the house is on fire. We know about the political division we have, but there's always ability to say, well, national service is a nice idea, but it's not an emergency. The problem with it's a solution that takes time. You've got to give people the opportunity. You've got to let the seed be planted in young people. You've got to sow so that you can reap later. And I would tell you, I think if we miss this opportunity again, and the reason it's an opportunity now is there's some momentum. There's some momentum built up a little bit by COVID, by the political situation, and there are people who have just worked hard and contributed and done it to get us to where it is. But frankly, we could meet here 12 months from now and that opportunity could have slipped away. And we could be talking about this and there just wouldn't be the same energy. There wouldn't be the same sense that we can make it up. The CORES Act might not pass or it might be so slimmed down that it doesn't matter. And then we're talking about what a great idea it is. Wouldn't it be nice if we did it? Well, I'm at the point now, I would say, it's not a nice thing to do anymore. If we don't do it, we're gonna be in a place where the country doesn't need to be or want to be. Questions? Does someone have a, a question for General McChrystal, please? Man. Uh, you know what? I, a microphone is about to arrive right in your lap. So hold on one second. In listening to your discussion about getting involved with universities, I can't help but feel that we really need to have the concept trickle down to high school and plant the seeds there because high school, I've had have, I've have three 20-somethings, and high school really was about GPAs, test scores, APs, and rather than some general concepts of community and the community service programs that everybody will applaud themselves for actually aren't really based in identifiable needs within the communities. It's, it's really not um, that productive in, in many, many areas. So is there a possibility? I'm thinking that if we all can't change some things, maybe we all can help change some of this in our roles within our own communities and perhaps boards and things that we are on. Yes, ma'am, I agree completely. I think you've got to plant the seed very, very early, the idea that they're going to serve so that when people get to an age and they're even thinking about whether they're going to go to college or not, they're already assuming that they are going to serve. And if you think about it, we don't plant it in young people very directly. I met with a uh, movie producer, a guy named Peter Berg, this last week, apparently very successful. And most heroes in movies now used to be, you know, the, the back story of them is I was a Navy SEAL or I was XX. When's the last time a hero used, came out of city year? What do we do to put it in popular culture so that we celebrate the fact that people do the Peace Corps, people do AmeriCorps or whatnot, are looked at as having done something really special? This has got to be an effort that we start very young so that people admire that. You know, you go through airports and you see people wearing World War II veteran, Vietnam veteran, and every once in a while, a current service people clap for them. What if somebody's wearing a city year hat? What if we clap and let them get on the airplane first? Bravo. Is there serving? Bravo. OK, one more question, please, over there. Actually, we're going to take two questions simultaneously with Ann. What? Not simultaneously, you're right. Who, go, who goes first? You go um, first, and the, then we'll go uh, to Judy. Okay, so when, when the Franklin Project began at the Aspen Institute, um, uh, I got involved with um, trying to get um, law firms and law schools to give um, one year of pay or free tuition, um, which, um, you know, has been of limited success, but um, I, I found it rewarding. The question I have for you is, is there anything on your website or any place else to go that would list um, opportunities that the people in this audience um, might take advantage of to try to promote um, uh, this effort, which is, in my judgment, 
of extraordinary importance. Wonderful. Can you pass it over to Judy, please? Laura, I'm sure both of you are very familiar with Teach for America. And Teach for America now has many, many alums that are spread all through the education system in America. And I would think that if you all made a relationship with Teach for America, they would be able to help instill this idea that you want service when they graduate from college. You're very lucky because Walter Isaacson was just recently the board chair of Teach for America, so we have a connection. <laughs> Great idea, Judy. Okay. Absolutely. The, the answer is there is information, but one of the challenges has been the, the scale of the movement lacks some of the administrative support and all this, the size of the staff to make it happen. And so it's imperfect. It will get better as we grow it. But the answer is, you're exactly right. We have to have and we'll follow up with simple you. ways on the website for people to, mm -hmm. to make things happen, either to help or to, to be helped. Come see us at the, at the speaker's reception after the, the three speeches this, morning, this afternoon. And uh, Stan, you really are a national hero to so many of us. We are so grateful to you for just taking your, your spokesperson's position of really making this a priority for all of our children and therefore our country. Let me just thank all the people who are really doing it. I just get to be a small part. Thank you. Thank Laura. you.